and we're going to start off with Chris Wagenmuller for uh, Gamma Remote Sensing, who's going to tell us all about his work with ISI. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. So this work was conducted at uh, Gamma Remote Sensing. Uh, I was supported by my colleagues, uh, Raphael Kadov, Christoph Manjar, Nina Jones, and uh, Tassio Strozzi. Okay. So to give a little bit background, this work was performed uh, within uh, Eurostars project is the name Ramon. The objective was to develop landslide services considering innovative uh, elements. And uh, these innovative elements included uh, terrestrial radar measurements. Uh, you saw maybe the presentation just uh, the second last before the lunch break with uh, the terrestrial uh, carborne L band radar. So we did such measurements. But then, um, the element I will report here is uh, to use novel satellite data and at the time uh, ISAI was still a plan and then during the acceptance of the project it became a reality with uh, first satellites. So the idea is not to present really this project that I cited but to share our experience with uh, ISAI and especially ISAI uh, interferometry. So over three, in three cases, I have nice data, and so this will make the main part uh, of the presentation. So it's differential interferometry and SBAS type processing over uh, Mojave. Then a PSI test over a part of uh, Tokyo in Japan, and uh, uh, SBAS test over a disco island uh, in Greenland. But before moving to this, uh, Quite nice examples. Uh, let me spend one slide on the relatively frustrating first two years of the project. So, um, ISAI started to launch satellites in uh, 2018, with one in January and one in uh, December, and then uh, further satellites uh, were added to this, and including in 2000, in January 2021. Um, the X6, which is uh, very useful and, and is the one mainly used uh, in this study, and um, you will hear why. So before 2021, with this uh, X6 launch, the spatial baselines of repeat observations have been uh, too long for differential interferometry. There was or is no strict orbit control to keep the satellites in a narrow orbital tube, and so we got plenty of examples to try, but sometimes it was 10 kilometer baselines or 1800 meter baselines. And so you got uh, maybe faint fringes in some slopes which are nicely oriented so that um, you have the better, best chance to get a little bit of uh, coherence. But overall, it was, it was not useful data. And this changed uh, then in, uh, with uh, X6. So, it is still drifting, but because it's in a one-day repeat cycle, uh, the drift is 200 meters per day, and that makes a reasonable and an, uh, easily usable uh, baseline for a repeat pass interferometry. So over the Mojave uh, Desert area, um, I used uh, this as a to, to look into some data characteristics, uh, backscatter and coherence, phase, height information, and displacement information could then uh, also be retrieved. Okay. So um, I got a, a big stack of data, so 51 strip map mode, X6, X6 uh, scenes uh, acquired in a period slightly longer than 51 days, and uh, it's high-resolution data with uh, range and azimuth pixel uh, spacings uh, around one meter. And you see in this uh, baseline time plot um, the, the drifting of the orbit, so it's relative to one date, and so you see it was uh, 
about a, a 10 kilometer drift and, and then uh, I don't know if there was a maneuver or if this happened, it moved into the other direction and then again slightly back and then again in the other direction. So overall there were longer periods, uh, long means 20 days and so on when it was substantially drifting in uh, one direction. So one consequence is, for example, that the temporal and spatial baselines are highly correlated. So you have to be uh, careful when running uh, two-dimensional uh, regressions with uh, such data. Um, here, a uh, backscatter image uh, is shown. So it's actually not just one scene, but it's the average over all the scenes. And so the radiometry is then uh, very nice and you see very clearly in the section uh, shown on the right. Um, this is a very nice site because it includes a range of corner reflectors, I think managed by uh, JPL. And so that's very useful to, to uh, investigate some of the characteristics uh, of the sensors like the point uh, target uh, respond. Uh, which we did of course and, and found uh, that uh, Spatial resolution is actually not uh, much worse than the sampling, so, so it is really a high resolution uh, data. It's about uh, 15 dB in one dimension and 12 dB uh, between the peak and side lobe uh, level. Looking at the backscatter images already showed that somehow the contrast in the near and far range is very low. And this is also confirmed here in this uh, coherence image. So again, an average over many pairs with less than three days intervals and shorter than 200 meter baselines. So you see, if you look carefully in the near range and far range, a significantly lower uh, coherence and the, the signal noise is the reason for this. So the noise equivalent sigma zero that we determined not in this scene, but in, in a more alpine scene where you also have a radar shadow, so you can quite easily uh, see the noise level there. Was uh, something like minus 16, minus 17 uh, dB in the center and up to minus 12, minus 12, uh, minus 11 to minus 12 uh, in the near and far range which is of course uh, not so nice for quite some uh, applications and for interferometry it means uh, some coherence loss. Uh, these are just examples of uh, interferograms, so you see it works, you get phases and maybe also some phase ramps uh, sometimes, so maybe um, uh, related to processing or, or baseline uh, inaccuracy, uh, but overall um, you, you see a nice phase uh, images. So based on this, on having many uh, uh, pairs available, um, we, we uh, determined on one hand uh, terrain height uh, correction to uh, Copernicus uh, DEM. So here on the left hand side you see uh, the Copernicus DEM and on the right side the, the improved one based on the ISI uh, stack. So the color scale is very fine between plus and minus five meter. Um, so, so you, you see small details, so you see the, the height is a little bit noisy in the flat area, for example, in the Copernicus at one, two meter um, level. Uh, and you see that the higher spatial resolution of the ISI data helps to get a slightly better um, resolution. So some of the features, if you look carefully at it, uh, are just a little bit more accurately uh, represented uh, in the combine, in the updated uh, PEM. And we were quite lucky um, that the time series also shows uh, deformation phase over um, the uh, wet uh, part, so, so probably uh, changes in, in moisture uh, underneath uh, resulted in, in some uh, uh, displacement. And, and so we could demonstrate that it's also useful, of course, uh, such a dense uh, time series to, to get uh, information on fast uh, displacements. So, so here it's in the order of uh, up two centimeter over uh, 67 days. Um, we got then another uh, stack, uh, again, quite many scenes um, over uh, part of uh, Tokyo. 
And so there we tried uh, single reference uh, PSI type uh, processing. Now doing this with a very, very short total uh, time period, you cannot expect to get a lot of deformation information, of course. Um, but still, it's it's very interesting. So to get to get uh, updated point heights, and based on the point heights, you can get a very accurate uh, georeferencing, and you can check this by comparison, for example, with a, a optical background in uh, Google Earth or so. So the the plot shows um, the the scenes selected uh, were nice in the sense that you had really. Uh, uncorrelated spatial and temporal uh, baseline. So that makes it a good uh, data stack. And the rest of the images would be along one of the axes uh, just in one direction. And so that would not really improve it, but make it more uh, delicate. And I jump directly uh, to the result. So you see here a lot of um, uh, points. And um, if you look carefully at it, um, even more carefully than you can maybe uh, based on, on what you see, uh, you see that the position of the points corresponds very closely. For example, you have uh, metal structures above the road, um, which are at several meters height. And so because of this height, the, the georeferencing is initially wrong by some meters, but with the height correction uh, determined uh, based on, on the time series, they fall then exactly in the right uh, location. And so um, it's really a, um, a very precise georeferencing then. So the, the statistical height estimation error that you get from, from the phase uh, standard deviation and the baseline set uh, is, is 15 uh, centimeter. And you can do other things like a coherence product. I'm always a fan of this. So you get also um, thematic information on the scene. So it's a combination of uh, coherence, uh, actually here average coherence over many very short term uh, interferograms uh, over the area, then combined with uh, the average backscattering and the backscatter temporal variability. And so you get this color image which corresponds nicely to, to um, land use. So you see uh, fields, forest, water area in different uh, colors. Then uh, the test uh, over Disco Island uh, in Greenland. Um, the site was actually selected as an alternative uh, to uh, having a Swiss Alpine test site, which was our intention. But there was no coverage at all with this uh, X6 satellite over Switzerland. And so we looked for a site with coverage and with fast displacement phenomena. And we knew from a project that we did uh, with other data sets that in uh, parts of Disco Island, you have this uh, situation. And so uh, as I acquired a stack of data over uh, Disco Island uh, for us. So we wanted to evaluate the potential for height differences uh, estimation uh, relative to a Copernicus stem and uh, uh, displacement uh, rates. So here you see the results. So the height corrections are quite substantial. So you see uh, here a scaling plus minus uh, 30 meter and you have um, uh, reductions of 30 meter in some parts. Uh, it's it's uh, mainly uh, 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 melting of uh, glacier uh, ice, and then you also see some positive values maybe in the accumulation zones. Uh, um, so it, in a qualitative sense, it definitely makes sense where you see uh, the, dis the, the differences. Uh. And on the right-hand side, you see the displacement rate. So the scale is between minus two meter per year and plus two meter per year. So it's determined on a short period. Um, but to, to have a better uh, feeling for the velocities, it's converted to, to a meter per year. And you see fast movements. And uh, if you zoom in, uh, you see uh, also the high resolution really gives you uh, nice details on, on uh, some processes. So it's very useful if you have plenty of expand data with short intervals. 
that's uh, definitely uh, great uh, to work with. The features you see are glaciers, uh, rock glaciers, landslides, maybe also some uh, snow fields uh, that, that uh, transform. So the ISI data are well suited for differential interferometry, uh, PSI, S-pulse type uh, processing uh, provided the spatial baselines are sufficiently small. The high spatial resolution of X-band uh, time series with a short uh, one-day time interval are particularly well suited for the mapping and monitoring of local millimeter to centimeter scale uh, ground uh, motion. So not millimeter, centimeter per year, but between the acquisitions. Uh, drifting uh, orbits and narrow uh, swaths uh, limit nevertheless strongly the applicability, uh, so I can still not do anything in uh, Switzerland, if I understand uh, correctly. Um, high noise equivalent sigma zero values uh, also reduce the backscatter contrast and uh, coherence, and so should also be avoided uh, in the future. So as recommendations, uh, I formulate that uh, operating the ISI satellites in narrow orbital tubes uh, would strongly improve the INSAR applicability. And uh, using higher gain antennas or increasing transmitter power would reduce the noise equivalent uh, sigma zero, resulting in higher quality backscatter images and higher co coherence. So all the applications, I think, would uh, benefit. Okay. That's it.